Well, hello there and welcome to the recording of another episode of Search Marketing Scoop. This is episode 17 of Search Marketing Scoop that we're going to be, going to be recording here live on YouTube. Uh, this is just the informal chat, the informal intro, just to say hi uh, before we uh, get going with the proper recording. Uh, so uh, as you're starting to join, there's a few people starting to join now. Uh, why don't you say hi? Why don't you say where in the world you happen to be joining us from? Are you in the UK? Are you in Canada, the States? Are you in India? Wherever you happen to be, let us know where you're from. And also let us know what your area of specialism happens to be. Are you an SEO specialist? Are you a paid search specialist? Are you a general digital marketer? Are you someone that has just wandered onto the live stream wondering what the heck has happened here? <laughs> Whatever you <laughs> happen to be, uh, let us know and say hi. We've got some um, some people starting to say hi from Vancouver, Minneapolis, um, Oregon, um, Seattle. I think my pronunciations of um, everywhere in the States isn't necessarily as good as it, uh, it would be if I was based there. So apologies about that. Um, and we've got um, both of our guests who um, are going to be on the show today interacting in the chat. That's a really cool thing to do. I'll be even more impressed if they interact while they're talking as well as part of the show. <laughs> we'll see if they do that. Um, but um, we've got a tech SEO specialist um, specializing in baking bread. Uh, okay. Uh, Simon, I presume it's not a baking bread website, but that happens to be your your passion. Um We'll see, um, I guess. Um, Ted from Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome, welcome. Um, it's great uh, having people interacting in the chat. Keep on interacting. We've got someone from Brazil here. Nice. Um, we've got Mateus uh, from Brazil. Amber uh, from Arkansas in the, in the States as well. Wonderful to have you all on here. Um, what I would like to know as well is um, what has happened um, in your area of work recently. Uh, and if you are working in the sphere of SEO, uh, have you noticed any search um, ranking fluxes over the last few days? Uh, I've been having a look at this tool recently, uh, the SEO Rush sensor tool, and there was a big spike um, on the 11th of September. I'm not sure if many of you noticed anything significant there happening, uh, going on. Um, we've got um, Shiro saying mobile search ranking on Google. So I, I reckon that's your area of focus. But if you've had any challenges, any um, ranking fluxes, um, and you're, you're happy to share that, why don't you share that in the chat and let us know what you're up to at the moment. Um, but I reckon um, now is about a good time um, to start this this general um, uh, intro, uh, in, intro chat and go into actually a proper introduction. Um, of course, um, this is going to be recording for the audio podcast. So the audio podcast is going to be published uh, in about four hours time or so. It'll go live on iTunes and um, different areas and Android. So just search for Search Marketing Scoop on there if you haven't subscribe to the podcast um, you won't get this wonderful introduction of course you'll just get the formal introduction which we'll start about now so i'll start start uh, stop yabbering on here start the proper introduction and um here we go big ads add a competition tab google tests image-based sub categorization bing has added text transcription to its image analysis capabilities and is the targeting of paid search marketing moving away from keywords to audiences. Broadcasting live in the SEO Rush YouTube channel, this is Search Marketing Scoop, the SEO Rush show that brings together the top PPC and SEO folk to discuss the current search headlines and how they impact you. I'm your host, David Bain. Let's meet today's guests. So first up, a pug and schnauzer lover. She's an experienced search marketer, and the head of evangelism for search at Microsoft. Welcome to The Scoop, Christy Olson. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi, welcome, Christy. Great to have you along here. Next up, an X-Files aficionado. She <laughs> is a regular event speaker and the writer of all things search for the SEM Post. Welcome, Jennifer Slag. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I don't know why these people write all these things in their Twitter bios and uh, think that people aren't going to read them out as... <laughs> normal bios. <laughs> Let's go back to Christy for story number one, and that is Bing Ads add a competition tab. 
So on Monday, Bing Ads announced three new AI-driven features, including a competition tab, where you keep track of how you're performing versus your competitors. So Christy, what's this one all about? Yes. So within paid search, we've noticed that uh, we have act we've been giving information essentially to our customers for a while, but it wasn't in a format that they said was easy to read, easy to use. And so after talking to our customers, we came back and revised essentially our auction insights tab and pulled together competition view. Um, what this essentially is, is giving you more information over time as to how your campaign has been faring and doing as compared to your competitors or those people who are showing in your auction. Now, I call that out only because um, as I talk to our customers on a regular basis, I go, yeah, well, it shows that, you know, XYZ is showing in my competitor. I don't consider them my direct competitors. Well, it's like the, these are the people who are bidding on the same keywords as you. So that's how we sort of categorize them together in in the competition tab. And so it's just giving you some really rich visual, vis, uh, visualizations. So you can segment your data, so you can look at time of day, device, um, filter down to a given specific competitor and see how you're faring over time. I love the sound of that because I, I remember years ago, I used to go to websites like SpyFu um, to really research to see what people had been bidding on in the past and to trying to see what was successful for competitors. Um, does that mean that um, it's less necessary now for paid search marketers to go to these kind of sites to do that kind of research? I would actually say no. I still think you're going to get a lot of really great information from different tools that can provide you keyword and ad text based information. This is literally just looking at your account um, and essentially saying, here's who's bidding on similar keywords and phrases. We're not going to give you the breakdown of all the terms and phrases that that competitor is bidding on. It's showing where there's overlap from that person versus your company. Um, and so there's still a lot of value that you can get doing keyword research and copy research using third party tools and platforms. Quite you, okay. Um, so I'm just tr trying to think what this really means strategically for paid search marketers. Um, so I mean, can practically, if someone's um, setting up a campaign or I, I guess um, finding new keyword phrases for an existing campaign, um, how would they actually use these tools to ensure that they were, I guess, targeting the, the their ads as effectively as possible? Well, part of it comes down to targeting. Part of it's just also understanding where do you sit within the overall auction, overall space. Um, I know when I've managed paid search accounts in the past, uh, we didn't. It's not necessarily that we were trying to aim for a certain position or above a competitor, but it's good to understand how your performance is, and then looking at where do you sit within that competitive set. Do you have more opportunity with your visibility, with your share of impressions with your share of clicks and then looking at that competitive set and look if you look and you notice that somebody that you don't think is your main competitor is really showing up on a regular basis maybe you have words and phrases in your account or in that campaign or ad group that aren't as targeted as, as you think they are and so it just gives you more insights to be able to look at your campaigns and get better understanding of where where you can go for changes um, and maybe you're doing things you didn't realize you were doing within that campaign set Got you. So it's how your existing campaign maps against the industry sector that you should be targeting and I guess identifying gaps in, in that analysis. Correct. And then the second set of that tab that we sort of released goes back to giving recommendations. So it's not just looking at your overall competitive performance, but then it's the recommendations tab, which we previously had in the UI. It's understanding what is it that we would recommend that you look to shift within your account. So do you have budgets that are um, hitting caps on a regular basis? The recommendations goes through and says, okay, if you increase your spend X percentage, here's what will happen in terms of impressions, clicks, conversions, et cetera, based on the data and information we have. So we'll give you more information about where you have opportunities within your existing account to either um, increase budgets, pull back budgets, add keywords, add negative keywords, um, just across your account. So it's going back to providing some more of the insights, not just at a competitive level, but also on your account to give you where you can go and spend time optimizing. This is especially amazing for less for the search marketing professionals that have everything on the day ins and day outs. But this is great for the small businesses running their accounts and running their campaigns that are maybe not sure always what they could be doing or should be doing for optimizing their accounts. I'm not discrediting this for search professionals. It's great to go there too. But it's also just great for the person that is still learning what to do and where to go just seeing here's what our tools and system recommend or think that you could be shifting and changing within your account. 
Great stuff. Okay, well, let's go over to Jennifer for story number two, and that is Google are changing or at least testing um, image-based subcategorization. Um, so Jennifer, what's this one all about? So basically, when Google shows a search result, it sometimes has an image in it and sometimes it has site links. But in this, it's actually showing a carousel that includes a little thumbnail image in each of the site links as well. And I think they are testing this live because I'm almost positive I have a screenshot of them testing this. It's I think it's really great because it's visual. It makes it easy for people to see it. And oh, I'm, this is actually what I'm looking for. So they can easily click it and go off to the exact either site link or subset within a page that they're trying to access. Um, I think there's going to be issues that a lot of people aren't optimizing their images very well, so they're not going to be able to take advantage of this. That's the big downside of Google going this route. Um, for example, a lot of people have featured snippets and they see their nice, happy featured snippet, and then they see an image from their competitor site showing up within their featured snippet mm -hmm. and they freak out. And I go and I look at their site and I'm like, well, the only actual image that Google could pull from your page is like your logo. So if you don't have an image that Google can use, they're not going to obviously be able to use it. So they're going to use your competitors instead. So the same kind of thing applies here. A lot of people don't have suitable images for Google to be pulling for these kind of site links. And if Google decides that these kind of site links are performing very well, they could actually decide to bump another site up higher because their site links do have associated images. And what's the most impactful code to be using for this? Is it HTML5 and using figure and figure caption? I think the bigger thing is that they need to um, use their tags that label the images properly, you know, clear file names, don't name your image like 3279.jpg, you know, have it, you know, clear keywords in that, you know, put um, captions next to the image. There's so many things like that that can help Google understand exactly what your image is about um, without making Google either guess or use a competitor's instead. Great. Okay. Yeah. Amber uh, was writing in the chat in the live chat saying, can you elaborate on what uh, a usable image for Google includes? But I think we've just done that, Amber. Yes. Um, <laughs> we've uh, preempted your question here. Now I'm going to try and think um, beforehand what the next question is going to be from the audience and, uh, and <laughs> try and come up with that before they ask that as well. Um, but um, it's, it's certainly an interesting thing that is um, being experimented with um, by Google here. Um, is this um, with the mobile web in mind or is this um, for the desktop as well, Jennifer? I definitely think you'll, we could probably see it on desktop, but I think it's best used on mobile simply because it's a smaller, you know, smaller screen size, less real estate. And if, peop and if Google can get across the same thing in an image that makes it easy for someone to see what they're looking for, um, Google's going to do that. Like we, we definitely see that mobile image or mobile search results are much more visual than your regular standard desktop results from Google. Okay, and uh, something else that I, I I thought was quite interesting about this was it appears that um, Google were uh, attempting to to categorize content um, and have the images um, that that were effectively um, representative of the categories. Um, do you think that in the future? I mean, I've noticed um, this in other areas as well. I've seen searches for terms like accounting software and um, for Google to have breadcrumb navigation um, to, um, to uh, for the user to go back to uh, view other accounting software. Um, so are Google attempting to categorize every website out there and perhaps even have um, an image to represent those categories, do you think? Um, they could. I mean, we obviously with this test, we're seeing that they're definitely, you know, doing that somewhat. Um, a lot of the breadcrumb things, it comes down to also how well the site owner is optimizing their site. If they're using breadcrumbs, if they're, you know, being clear about their hierarchy on their website, because if Google has to guess, they're usually, they're sometimes good, but sometimes you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Christy didn't pay you to say that, did she? No. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> But I mean, generally, um, image optimization is certainly something that SEO should leverage better and that um, there's there's potentially a lot of value in that. Is that from 
images appearing within rich snippets and within these sections perspective or is there also value for uh, appearing within image search as well definitely within image search as well we've seen google do a ton of updates for how they're presenting their image search results categorizing things filtering things and again it's it's that optimization thing so many sites aren't optimizing their images and image search performs very well, um, especially if people are clicking through to your site. Um, having a high ranking image for a competitive keyword that you aren't able to get in the top 10 of the regular search results, some, if you can nail it in the image search results, especially if your competitors are you know, not optimizing or not presenting really good images, it can work very, very well for people. Oh, we're and gonna... definitely some image searches are more or some searches are definitely more visual so people tend to gravitate to images as well okay so it depends on possibly the industry and certainly the type of search that that, that people are going to do and, and go for it christy and i was also going to add into jennifer's comment is that you start to look at some of the options happening within image search itself the bill the ability to actually search within an image you have that on pinterest and you have that on bing today where if you see something you can take the take an image and you can take it from your mobile device or you can just take an existing image and actually go and try to get more context and information about something within the image so let's take the if i were to take a screenshot of you sitting there right now david and i want to know what what is that flag in the background it might be I'm guessing like Norway or Denmark or Sweden, maybe. Or Don't Scotland, maybe. Ah, so, so, okay. You can tell I know my European flags quite well. But if I didn't know that, I could essentially zoom in on that image, section of the image, and essentially get more context using essentially computer vision or AI on the back end. So it's partially why it's important to start having clean image labels to give context about what's in an image. But because essentially we're getting to the point where we can search within an image itself, you can also find products and do essentially shopping within an image. Mike Lyons is asking, does anyone know what percentage of uh, image or, or, or searches are image based? Um, do either of you have any thoughts on that one? off the top of my head no. yeah i don't know off the top of my head either like it's obviously a... some are some have much higher like people searching for fashion for example right. if they don't know like i if i'm looking for like a you know an item of clothing or some shoes or something a lot of times i'll hit up the image search because i can quickly flip through you know pages of results and be like that's the one i want without having to go through like uh you know a website that's selling shoes and trying to filter it that way and well, they're usually slower too. <laughs> I, I mean, probably because you know, Christy was coming on. I, I spent a bit of time on on Bing and uh, going through uh, image search. And um, I tell you what, I really loved the experience there. I haven't been on there for a while, and I was really impressed by things like uh, the the listing of pages using this image, uh, related mm -hmm. images, and um, th there's a lot of functionality within there that makes it um, a nice and immersive experience. And obviously, we had a a news story this week saying that um, um, Bing has added text transcription to its image analysis capabilities. Um, so, I mean, kind of sticking with Jennifer, I mean, what are your thoughts on this one? Does this mean that um, images are certainly going to be a lot more important in the future in terms of helping search engines to understand the context of your content? I think, especially SEOs have always been very interested in how um google and bing are using ocr um it to to be able to determine what an image is about like pulling text from an image and then indexing the image based on that text for example and seeing bing obviously definitely has a capability google has said yeah we have it but we're, we're not using it in search right now but seeing bing using it in this way i think is really interesting because it opens up a lot of doors for you know, a lot of these great images that are out there, um, infographics, for example, but they're not indexed based on the actual content within the image. But being able to do that, I think is pretty exciting. And from the blog post from Bing, it looks like they're doing a pretty good job of how they're doing it. Um, it looks like it's only, maybe Christy can answer, it looks like it's only available in the app, right? A specific app right now. It's not being used in regular image search for Bing. 
It is getting rolled out slowly. And so part of this is we have um, Ginny Lay Fleury, who is our chief accessibility officer, has really been looking at how we create more inclusive products. So looking at for people that have visual disabilities, how do we essentially give more information and context to them of what's within an image? So right now, um, the Scene AI app is one of the apps that definitely has this integrated into it. And they're taking that context from the Scene AI app and putting it directly into the Bing search results. So I know it's on the app and rolling out but I, I would expect this to also be on desktop at some point in time in the near future because it is really looking at how can we essentially help individuals get more context behind what's on the internet. So is this something that content publishers should be thinking of taking advantage of at the moment and perhaps even publishing some of their written content in image form to give them greater design uh, abilities? So I would I would make the recommendation that's been a best practice for SEO for a while, and that is it, assume that anything within an image in terms of optimization today and ranking today is not readable. Um, it, it will be part or it could be part of the algorithm in the future. It is not part of the algorithm today. So if you have a static image with text on it, this, not all search engines can read it. That's where essentially what Jennifer is recommending before of using your alt text, using your uh, all the fields available to you to essentially explain here's what is in this image. You'll still want to do that. And as a related subject, um, video, do search engines attempt to understand what's being talked about within a video if there's no transcripts available? I think right now Google or YouTube is has transcripts available for just about every video, at least a lot of the ones I look at where I'm more interested in seeing the transcript as opposed to listening to a, you know an hour long video about something if I'm just interested in a certain part. So they're definitely doing that as well as if you see some featured snippets that are actually um, video content, Google will actually pinpoint, oh, you want to, you want the part of the video that's between like two minutes and 12 seconds and three minutes and, you know, 14 seconds. And here is that exact section of the video. So Google is definitely using that to index content for sure. Absolutely. That's good. That's really interesting and maybe a little bit scary as well, um, because if you've produced a video and perhaps the first few seconds of it is talking about your brands and Google is taking you straight to the, the section that um, just provides the content, then you have to think about that as a content producer and as, as to you know how you actually ensure that there's that brand recognition as well as the, the content being delivered. I think as well, like some, like this intro was really short, but sometimes you watch some videos and it's like 30 seconds of, hey, here's our subscribe button. Here's like us and share us and blah, blah, blah. And, and we're awesome and you should follow us. And, and you're just like, please, like, can we just get to like what we're actually here to watch? Yeah, <laughs> like, where's the Netflix fast forward button? <laughs> It's not well, only Google search engines. Is starting, or YouTube is starting to actually skip an intro, but I don't know if that is from the content creator point of view, where they can, they have an option where you can just skip directly to the content, or if it's something that YouTube is doing to because people are, you know, putting these stupid long thirty-second intros on videos. Wow, I mean, it's an important thing to think of from a usability perspective. But if you're annoying search engines as well as users, you're, you're not doing a very good job. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, let's um, go over to the, the final story, actually, and that's um, is the targeting of paid search marketing moving away from keywords to audiences. So this is um, a story for Christy. Um, so Christy, there are plenty of articles around at the moment that talk about shifting from keywords to audiences um, with regards to targeting. Is this really a good thing for most paid search marketers to be thinking of and doing at the moment? So I would say yes. And I would say that the shift, um, the shift isn't that keywords aren't important. It's that now we have so much more ability to use audiences to understand intent, actions, and behaviors, and really create hyper-targeted marketing campaigns. So understanding um, essentially the action somebody's taking and thinking about your path to purchase and your user journey and mapping that along with your keywords to essentially reach the customers and make much more targeted ads. Should people be doing this? Absolutely, yes. And that I guess this is my opinion, um, but I've also been saying for about five years now, since RLSA came out, their marketing list for search ads, 
everybody should be doing this. And in my opinion, almost every campaign could be an RLSA campaign because of the power you have for targeting and including excluding audiences to be so much more specific with how you reach essentially either your customers or your potential customers. And do you start off like that or do you start off with keywords and get your campaign going and then switch towards audiences after that? So you always will have keywords. Keywords are still there. Audience is a layer on top of it. So essentially the way I like to explain this is a really simple area is let's say you have a brand um, and your brand is, I'll use Microsoft so since other brands get mad when I use their brand or say, why did you use us, not somebody else? But let's say Microsoft.com. If we know that somebody already is subscribed to Office, um, Office 365, and we have a set of keywords for Office 365, maybe I'd want to exclude the people who've already purchased Office. Office 365 and have an existing subscription so that when they're searching for the brand, we serve them help and how to content. We're not reaching them with a sales related message. You can do that by having an audience of existing customers and putting a negative on top of your Office 365. And then you create a separate essentially campaign or ad group that has your Office 365 keywords and everybody who's a current customer, and you can give them a different experience. And it also gives you, so you can target the same keyword in different ways, essentially based on what you know from an audience um, and how you've set up your marketing list for search. But it also means you can have different bid strategies. You can go after different keywords. You can change your ad copy, your messaging, and your landing pages. It just gives you so much more ability to be hyper-specific with what you're doing and how that I absolutely love it. What would you say to a paid search marketer that just feels it isn't being that hyper-specific because they feel that if they have complete control themselves and they just select keywords, then they know precisely what they want their ad to appear for? How would you, um, how would you discuss things with them? So I actually had this conversation with a very large e-commerce site based out of uh, Minnesota this last summer. And it's the, the idea is that you can do a lot with keywords, but when you add the layer of actions or intent on top of keywords, it just gives you the ability to be much more granular with how you reach them. Keywords are great. We get a lot of information based on keywords, but if you already know that somebody's been to your site and done something, it gives you a different level of intent. It gives you a different level of how you can engage with them, where you can engage with them, and maybe how you'd want to bid against them. Okay, so keywords are a good starting point, but to get more granular and to expand your audience in ways that you hadn't even thought of before, then you need to think of audiences for that. Yep. That was a <laughs> black <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> 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 quick. Yes. Think about remarketing. <laughs> um, I, I just want to bring Jennifer in briefly as well. Um, Jennifer, obviously, um, within the world of SEO, um, keywords you know have been incredibly important. Are keywords losing their importance, or are they just as important as they uh, ever have been? I think it's still very important. Like we have seen, Google will index and rank. Uh, pages for content when the specific keyword isn't necessarily on the page because it knows it's hyper related to a different keyword. But it's no guarantee. Like there's still a lot of people like, I want to rank for, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you don't have that word on your page. How, how do you think Google's going to figure out that you want to rank for that word when you don't have that word anywhere? And they're like, but, but and it's like, Google is smart, but not quite that smart for a lot of the time. So yeah, keywords are still super important. You need to make sure that you have the keywords on the page. You don't have to go overboard where you have like plurals and non-plurals and, you know, all the different specific variations of a keyword. Google is very good at figuring that out, but Google is not as good at figuring out that you want your page to be about specific keywords if you don't include them or only include something slightly related. Christy, we've got um, Shiro Hattori asking question, is audience marketing only for remarketing right now? Um, it's it's for any campaigns, isn't it? Um, uh, he's obviously talking about Google specifically there, but I would imagine in Bing as well, it's for any campaigns? Correct. So you can do remarketing right now across any campaign. So you can do it on shopping campaigns. You can do it across text campaigns. Um, right now, you can also use it through the Microsoft Audience Network, where you can use an image and do essentially native targeting using essentially we have our AI algorithm on the back end that figures out where do we put those placements across MSN, Outlook, and the Microsoft Network. Great. Okay. But yeah. Sorry for cussing you off there. No, no. The only other one I was going to add is on what Jennifer was saying for keywords. Something that's also interesting that you can take, and it'll be more Bing specific. I haven't seen this on Google yet today, is that we are doing what we call multi-perspective answers. So if you ask a question like, should I run 10 miles a day? Um, we're not just going to be looking at the keywords related to 
um, like the, the positives, but we'll also try to get a perspective answer to give you the negatives. So you might start to see you're getting traffic for the inverse of what you're saying within your site and your content, because we're trying to provide a more holistic view so people can form their opinions and understand a topic. So it's just something new to be thinking about with how you're ranking for search and rating for search is you could also start to show up for the inverse of what you thought you were ranking for. Interesting. Wow, I'd have to go away and think about that for a while. <laughs> well, think like uh, the example we always give, which I hate it because uh, is like, is kale good for you? Is kale bad for you? <laughs> okay, got you. And, so you um, might be ranking for your site thinks kale is the best vegetable on the planet. Mm. Um, and you could actually be showing up for is kale bad for me as a keyword set. Got you. Okay, so you really <laughs> have to use the um, the ability to um, to provide context uh, around what you're doing. Yeah. And it's the fact that we're trying to provide more information so people can make decisions, not just on news stories. Um, and I gave an example yesterday about in the U.S., we have a Senate hearing going on for the Supreme Court where they're essentially pulling the context of here's what both sides are saying about this candidate. So that way you can you're not just getting the far right or the far left's point of view on it. You can actually see what are both sides saying so you can form your opinion and understand what's going on within that scenario. Now, we were also talking about a couple of things that um, Bing have been doing and Google haven't. Um, something that Google have been doing is caching AMP um, and uh, Bing uh, haven't until recently, but that's changing. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Christy? Yes, we actually just pushed the announcement live this morning. It's been live for a couple of days now. But essentially, if you've been using AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages, um, Google and Bing have both working on this project since 2016. But I don't know if most people knew that all the content, all the AMP content was hosted through Google, meaning that Bing as a search engine, if we were using AMP content, it was going through Google servers. So we've been working on the back end for the last two years to figure out how do we host our own cache so that when we have AMP content going through Bing, it's hosted through our own servers and we essentially have control over that. So we actually released an AMP cache as of this week um, to allow essentially ourselves to own and host the content. What this means for webmasters is that essentially you need to make sure that you're allowing Bingbot to fetch your content, especially if you're using AS, AS, <laughs> AMP. In addition to this, um, you need to allow cross-origin resource sharing, CRS, for bing-amp.com so that we can essentially, um, for that domain, so we can essentially host that content. Wonderful, okay, yeah, so that's a, that's a big thing that's happening there and what happens then if someone doesn't do that, if a developer doesn't do that on their side? So right now, we are still in the process of migrating. We're using the bing-amp.com domain to essentially host our cache. We know that since it's just starting, we are pulling from both sources, but we will have a cutoff date that we will announce some point in time in the future as to when we will only be pulling from essentially our AMP cache. So for the short term, we're getting the word out, letting people know, here's what's happening, here's the change that's coming. We'll pull from both sides. Once we have that cutoff date, if you're not allowing BingBot to fan fetch your content and you're not allowing the cross-origin resource sharing, essentially we will pull the non-AMP based content. So it'll be just a not as good user experience on the back end. Wonderful. And Simon Cox was asking uh, in the chat for more information about that. Our other guest, um, Jennifer, has um, <laughs> provided the blog link within the chat for that. So thanks for that, Jennifer. I'm sure, Jennifer, you'll be writing an article about this very soon as well. So Sorry, for Jennifer. <laughs> So for people that have websites, um, how can they make sure that for the people that aren't very techy, but do have AMP like with like the WordPress AMP uh, plugin, how can they make sure that Bing can read and see their AMP cache? Yes. So we're actually... Um, we do have the AMP viewer directly in Bing Webmaster Tools, so you can log in and we are showing, is it is it displaying correctly or not? And we are working with essentially... Um, well, we're working with several different WordPress sites, um, including Yoast, to make sure that our content is essentially viewable. So we've been we've been having conversations for a while, which is partially why I was hoping we would have this announcement in the <laughs> June July timeframe. But we wanted to make sure everything was set up before we really go and release and launch. So, is well, there any the that, that third party uh, sites that are using Google's AMP cache might use Bing's AMP cache instead? We are hoping. And I, what I would say for this is it comes back to, if you imagine search engines want to sort of 
ha every search engine has its own index. We aren't pulling, like Bing has its own separate index. Google has an index, the index has an index, Baidu has an index, Yahoo has an index. So when you start to look across the search engines and their indexes, it's gonna be the same within AMP that most individual search engines do not wanna rely on another search engine for their base of content. So I would say we are the second person to release an AMP cache, but I'm assuming we will not be the last. I think that would be a safe assessment to make. So we, I, I would expect to see something else like this coming in the future from other search engines. Other search engines. Okay. Well, watch the space, I, I reckon. That, that, that was a, a wonderful way to finish. I think there's a lot of people that are going to be very intrigued to find out more about that and going to be um, actively looking at your post on, um, on um, Bing.com at the moment, so your uh, blogs.bing.com. Um, URL that you shared. Um, thanks so much for um, bringing that to our attention. That just about takes us to the end of our 17th episode. Just time for an actual tip from each of our guests related to or not necessarily related to what we have been discussing so far. So let's go back to Jennifer for the first one. So um, Jennifer, what is your actual tip? I'm going to go with the image thing. Make sure you're optimizing your images. And if you don't have great images on pages, go out and you know purchase stock photography, take your own photos. There are so many opportunities that people are missing in search because they don't have great images on their content pages. Great advice. And you can find Jennifer over at thesempost.com. And Christy, uh, what is your actionable tip? Ah, uh, there's so many to go with. I'm going to start with remarketing and just say, if you're not using remarketing and remarketing audiences today within paid search, do it. Um, there's some really simple, easy audiences you can take advantage of that don't require you to have the UET tag, like in market audiences. So if, you're, if your barrier is, oh, I don't want to have to create a remarketing list, it's too much time and too much effort, start with in market audiences, go from there and test it out. So far, everybody I've seen that have used it, including myself on all past campaigns, remarketing has done amazing. Wonderful. And you'll find Christy over at Christy J. Olson on Twitter. I've been your host, David Bain. You can find me over at digitalmarketingradio.com. We will be recording the next episode, episode 18 of Search Marketing Scoop at the same time, same place, the SEM Rush YouTube channel on Wednesday, the 26th of September in one week's time, when my guests are scheduled to be Stefan Spencer from stephanspencer.com and David Chatella from fmbmedia.com. In the meantime, thanks not only to Christy and Jennifer for this episode, but also for you for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to the audio podcast. So head over to searchmarketingscoop.com and find the link there to your preferred Apple or Android flavor of podcatcher. And if you're already a Search Marketing Scoop audio podcaster, podcaster, subscriber, you know what I'm trying to say. Tell us what you think. A rating and review inside your podcast app would be very much appreciated. But until next time, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios. <laughs>